chapter nineteen of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen grant visits sheridan good news from winchester grant under fire at fort harrison consternation in richmond secretary stanton visits grant how grant received the news from cedar creek general grant listened with manifest interest to the report which i brought of the situations at atlanta and of sherman's feelings and intentions and asked many questions as to the condition of the great army of the west i found that during my absence the general-in-chief had paid a visit to sheridan he had started from city point on the fifteenth of september and had passed through washington without stopping and had gone directly to charleston where sheridan then had his headquarters he went from there to burlington new jersey where it was arranged to place his children at school and returned to city point on the nineteenth he spoke with much pleasure and satisfaction of his visit to sheridan and said i was so anxious not to have the movement made in the valley unless i felt assured of its success that i thought i would go and have a talk with sheridan before giving a decided answer as to what should be done i had written out a plan of campaign for his guidance and did not stop at washington for the reason that i thought there might be a disposition there to modify it and make it less aggressive i first asked sheridan if he had a plan of his own and if so what it was he brought out his maps and laid out a plan so complete and spoke so confidently about his ability to whip the enemy in his front that i did not take my plan out of my pocket but let him go ahead i also decided not to remain with him during the movement which was to begin in a day or two for fear it might be thought that i was trying to share in a success which i wished to belong solely to him in speaking of his visit to the middle military division general grant said i ordered sheridan to move out and whip early an officer present ventured the remark i presume the actual form of the order was to move out and attack him no answered the general i mean just what i say i gave the order to whip him sheridan advanced promptly on september nineteenth and struck early's army at winchester where he gained a signal victory capturing five guns and nine battle flags he pursued the enemy the next day as far as fisher's hill and on the twenty second attacked him again in front and flank carried his earthworks at every point captured sixteen guns and eleven hundred prisoners put him to flight and completed his destruction this left sheridan in possession of the valley of virginia he had obeyed to the letter his orders to whip early general grant sent cordial congratulations to the victorious commander and ordered a salute of one hundred guns in honor of each of his victories no events had created more rejoicing in the mind of the general-in-chief than these brilliant triumphs of sheridan the general had taken the sole responsibility of bringing sheridan east and placing him in command of a separate important army amid the doubts of some of the principal officials at washington and these victories on the part of the young commander were an entire vindication of grant's judgment the spirits of the loyal people of the north were beginning to droop and the disloyal element had become still more aggressive and such victories just at this time were of inestimable value during grant's visit to sheridan the enemy's cavalry had made a bold dash round the left of meade's line and captured over two thousand head of cattle one evening after grant's return at the close of a conversation upon this subject a citizen from washington who was stopping at city point inquired of him when do you expect to starve out lee and capture richmond never replied the general significantly if our armies continue to supply him with beef cattle the general-in-chief was still planning to keep the enemy actively engaged in his own immediate front so as to prevent him from detaching troops against distant commanders he telegraphed sherman september twenty sixth i will give them another shake here before the end of the week on the twenty seventh he sent a dispatch to sheridan saying no troops have passed through richmond to reinforce early i shall make a break here on the twenty ninth all these dispatches were of course sent in cipher definite instructions were issued on the twenty seventh for the break which was in contemplation burney's and ord's corps of butler's army were to cross on the night of september twenty eighth to the north side of the james river at deep bottom and attack the enemy's forces there if they succeeded in breaking through his lines they were to make a dash for richmond 
while the general did not expect to capture the city by this movement he tried to provide for every emergency thinking that if the enemy's line should be found weak there would be a bare chance after having once broken through of creating a panic in richmond and getting inside of its inner works ord and burney moved out promptly before daylight on september twenty nine general grant left a portion of his staff at city point to communicate with him and meade and rode out taking the rest of us with him to butler's front ord moved directly against fort harrison a strong earthwork occupying a commanding position carried it by assault captured fifteen guns and several hundred prisoners and secured possession of an entire line of entrenchments everything promised further success when ord was wounded so severely in the leg that he had to leave the field and proper advantage was not taken of the important success which had been gained burney moved with his colored troops against the line of entrenchments on the new market road promptly carried it and drove the enemy back in great confusion general grant was with burney's command in the early part of the day his youngest son jesse had obtained permission that morning to go up the river on the boat which carried his father and had taken along his black shetland pony called little reb the boy was then only a little over six years old and was dressed in kilts probably in honor of his scotch ancestors when the party reached the north side of the river and mounted and rode out to the front jesse got on little reb and followed along his father was so busy in supervising the movement that he did not notice the boy until he got under fire when on looking around he saw his enterprising heir moving about as coolly as any of the others of the group while the shots were striking the earth and stirring up the dust in every direction what's that youngster doing there cried the general manifesting no little anxiety and turning to the junior aide added dunn i wish you would take him to the rear and put him where he will be safe but jesse had too much of his sire's blood in his veins to yield a prompt compliance and at first demurred dunn however took hold of little reb's bridle and started him on a gallop toward the river and the boy much to his mortification had to beat an ignominious retreat dunn was more troubled than any one else over this masterly retrograde movement for he was afraid that the troops who saw him breaking for the rear under fire might think that he had suddenly set too high a value on his life and was looking out for a safe place after the capture of the works by burney's troops the general-in-chief rode over to fort harrison to push matters in that direction he was greatly gratified at the handsome manner in which the fort had been carried and the pluck which had been shown by the troops the fort was an enclosed work and formed a salient upon the enemy's line there were batteries in its rear however which still commanded it the general rode up to a point near the ditch and there dismounted and made his way into the work on foot the ground gave ample evidence of the effects of the assault and was so torn with shot and shell and covered with killed and wounded in some places that the general had to pick his way in stepping over the dead bodies that lay in his path he turned his looks upward to avoid as much as possible the ghastly sight and the expression of profound grief impressed upon his features told as usual of the effect produced upon him by the sad spectacle upon entering the fort he climbed up and looked over the parapet on the north side and remained there for some time viewing the surrounding works and taking a look at richmond while the enemy's batteries continued to shell us this was the nearest view of the city he had yet obtained and the church spires could be indistinctly seen he made up his mind that both corps should move forward promptly and sat down on the ground tucked his legs under him and wrote the following dispatch to burney dated at ten thirty five a m general ord has carried the very strong works and some fifteen pieces of artillery and his corps is now ready to advance in conjunction with you general ord was wounded and has returned to his headquarters leaving general heckman in command of the troops push forward on the road i left you on the enemy's projectiles were still flying in our direction and when the general had reached the middle of the dispatch a shell burst directly over him those standing about instinctively ducked their heads but he paid no attention to the occurrence and did not pause in his writing or even look up the handwriting of the dispatch when finished 
did not bear the slightest evidence of the uncomfortable circumstances under which it was indicted general butler had ridden up to the fort his face flushed with excitement and in an interview which followed with general grant the commander of the army of the james grew enthusiastic in lauding the bravery of the colored troops who had carried so handsomely the work which burney had assaulted that morning general grant had not heard from meade since early in the morning and feeling somewhat anxious he now made his way out of the fort mounted his horse and rode over to deep bottom at which point he could communicate by a field telegraph line with the commander of the army of the potomac about half past one o'clock the general received a telegram at deep bottom from the president saying i hope it will lay no constraint on you nor do harm any way for me to say i am a little afraid lest lee sends reinforcements to early and thus enables him to turn upon sheridan it will be seen that the president did not pretend to thrust military advice upon his commander but only modestly suggested his views the general replied immediately your dispatch just received i am taking steps to prevent lee sending reinforcements to early by attacking him here and closed with an account of the successes of the morning but little further progress was made during the day north of the james general grant remained on the north side of the river until after four p m and then returned to city point so as to be within easy communication with meade and to determine what should be done the next day it was long after midnight before any one at headquarters went to bed and then only to catch a nap of a couple of hours general grant set out again for deep bottom at five o'clock the next morning and after consulting with butler and finding everything quiet on the part of the enemy he decided that no movement should be made on that front at present and returned to city point starting back at eight a m the activity this day was on meade's front his troops moved out two miles west of the weldon railroad and captured two redoubts a line of rifle pits a gun and over one hundred prisoners three times that afternoon the enemy made vigorous efforts to recover the works which had been captured by butler's army the day before for they commanded the shortest road to richmond so important was the movement deemed for their recapture that lee was present in person with the troops who made the attack every assault however was handsomely repulsed meade threw up a strong line of entrenchments from the weldon railroad to the advanced position which he had captured and his left was now only about two miles from the south side railroad in these movements no little advantage had been gained the ability to carry strong works had encouraged the troops and the circle had been closed in still further upon lee both on their right and left and the effect upon the enemy was shown by the consternation and excitement which prevailed in richmond from refugees scouts and other sources of information it was learned that there was a feeling prevailing among the inhabitants that the city would very soon have to be abandoned provost marshal's guards seized all available citizens young and old and impressed them into the service whether sick or well government clerks and even the police being put in line in butler's front all business was suspended as there was no one left to attend to it publication of the newspapers was interrupted shops were closed and alarm bells were rung from all the churches in the meantime the enemy was having no rest in the shenandoah valley on the ninth of october sheridan's cavalry under torbert had an engagement with the enemy's cavalry which it completely routed capturing eleven guns and a number of wagons and taking over three hundred prisoners our loss did not exceed sixty men the enemy was pursued about twenty-six miles in the forenoon of october sixteen a steamer arrived from washington having aboard the secretary of war mr stanton the new secretary of the treasury mr fessenden who had succeeded chase and several of their friends they came at once to headquarters were warmly received by general grant and during their short stay of two days were profuse in their expressions of congratulation to the general upon the progress he had made with his armies they wanted to see as much as they could of the positions occupied by our forces and the general proposed that they should visit the army of the james that afternoon and offered to accompany them 
he telegraphed butler to this effect and the party started up the river by boat i was invited to join the excursion and was much interested in the conversations which occurred stanton did most of the talking he began by saying in getting away from my desk and being able to enjoy the outdoor air i feel like a boy out of school i have found much relief in my office from the use of a high desk at which i at times stand up and sign papers it has been said that the best definition of rest is change of occupation and even a change of attitude is a great rest to those who have to work at desks he then gave a graphic description of the anxieties which had been experienced for some months at washington on account of the boldness of the disloyal element in the north and the emissary sent there from the south sheridan's name was mentioned in terms of compliment general grant said yes sheridan is an improvement upon some of his predecessors in the valley of virginia they demonstrated the truth of the military principle that a commander can generally retreat successfully from almost any position if he only starts in time stanton laughed heartily at the general's way of putting it and remarked but in all retreats i am told that there is another principle to be observed a man must not look back i think it was caesar who said to an officer in his army who had retreated repeatedly but who afterward appeared before his commander and pointed with pride to a wound on his cheek ah i see you are wounded in the face you should not have looked back at aiken's landing general butler joined the party and pointed out the objects of interest along his lines mr stanton then spoke with much earnestness of the patient labors and patriotic course of the president there had been rumors of disagreements and unpleasant scenes at times between the distinguished secretary of war and his chief but there evidently was little if any foundation for such reports and certainly upon this occasion the secretary manifested a genuine personal affection for mr lincoln and an admiration for his character which amounted to positive reverence mr stanton wore spectacles and had a habit of removing them from time to time when he was talking earnestly and wiping the glasses with his handkerchief his style of speech was deliberate but his manner at times grew animated and he presented a personality which could not fail to interest and impress all who came in contact with the great carnot of our war the next morning after breakfast the secretary's party went by the military railroad to our lines about petersburg where they had pleasant interviews with meade hancock warren and park and returned in the afternoon to city point after some further consultation with general grant about the military situation particularly in the valley of virginia the secretary with his friends started back to washington sheridan had been ordered to washington to consult with the authorities there and as no immediate attack on the part of the enemy was expected he started for that city on october sixteen early however had concentrated all the troops that could be brought to his assistance and was determined to make a desperate effort to retrieve the defeats which he had suffered in the valley sheridan arrived in washington on the seventeenth and started back to his command at noon of that day the next day he reached winchester which was twenty miles from his command and remained there that night at three o'clock in the afternoon of october twenty general grant was sitting at his table in his tent writing letters several members of the staff who were at headquarters at the time were seated in front of the tent discussing some anticipated movements the telegraph operator came across the campground hurriedly stepped into the general's quarters and handed him a dispatch he read it over and then came to the front of the tent put on a very grave look and said to the members of the staff i'll read you a dispatch i have just received from sheridan we were all eager to hear the news and we felt that the telegram was of importance the general began to read the dispatch in a very solemn tone it was dated ten p m the night before i have the honor to report that my army at cedar creek was attacked this morning before daylight and my left was turned and driven in confusion in fact most of the line was driven in confusion with the loss of twenty pieces of artillery i hastened from winchester where i was on my return from washington and joined the army between middleton and newton having been driven back about four miles here the general looked up shook his head solemnly and said that's pretty bad isn't it 
a melancholy chorus replied it's too bad too bad now just wait till i read you the rest of it added the general with a perceptible twinkle in his eye he then went on reading more rapidly i here took the affair in hand and quickly united the corps formed a compact line of battle just in time to repulse an attack of the enemy's which was handsomely done at about one p m at three p m after some changes of the cavalry from the left to the right flank i attacked with great vigor driving and routing the enemy capturing according to last reports forty-three pieces of artillery and very many prisoners i do not yet know the number of my casualties or the losses of the enemy wagon trains ambulances and caissons in large numbers are in our possession they also burned some of their trains general ramseur is a prisoner in our hands severely and perhaps mortally wounded i have to regret the loss of general bidwell killed and generals wright grover and ricketts wounded wright slightly wounded affairs at times looked badly but by the gallantry of our brave officers and men disaster has been converted into a splendid victory darkness again intervened to shut off greater results by this time the listeners had rallied from their dejection and were beside themselves with delight the general seemed to enjoy the bombshell he had thrown among the staff almost as much as the news of sheridan's signal victory in these after years when this victory is recorded among the most brilliant battles of the war and sheridan's ride has been made famous in song and story one cannot help recalling the modesty with which he spoke of his headlong gallop to join his command and snatch victory from defeat he dismissed it with the sentence i hastened from winchester where i was on my return from washington and joined the army further news brought the details of the crushing blow he had struck the enemy general grant in referring to the matter at headquarters commented at great length upon the triumph which sheridan had achieved and the genius he had displayed he telegraphed to washington turning what bid fair to be a disaster into a glorious victory stamps sheridan what i have always thought him one of the ablest of generals and then in conversation sheridan's courageous words and brilliant deeds encourage his commanders as much as they inspire his subordinates while he has a magnetic influence possessed by few other men in an engagement and is seen to best advantage in battle he does as much beforehand to contribute to victory as any living commander his plans are always well matured and in every movement he strikes with a definite purpose in view no man would be better fitted to command all the armies in the field he ordered one hundred guns to be fired in honor of sheridan's decisive victory End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty grant's narrow escape at hatcher's run discussing the march to the sea why grant never held councils of war how the march to the sea was conceived and executed even before the completion of sheridan's victory in the valley grant was planning another movement for the purpose of threatening lee's position keeping him occupied and attacking his communications on october twenty four he directed both meade and butler to prepare for a movement which was to be made on the twenty seventh meade was to move against the south side road while butler was to go to the north side of the james again and make a demonstration there against the enemy early in the morning of october twenty seven general grant with his staff started for the headquarters of the army of the potomac and rode out to the front accompanied by meade the morning was dark and gloomy a heavy rain was falling the roads were muddy and obstructed and tangled thickets dense woods and swampy streams confronted the troops at all points the difficulties of the ground made the movements necessarily slow after a conference with warren grant and meade rode over to hancock's front and found that the enemy was there disputing the passage of hatcher's run at burgess's mill his troops were strongly posted with a battery in position directly in front of the head of hancock's corps and another about eight hundred yards to our left unless this force on the opposite side of the stream could be driven back 
our lines could not be thrown forward for the purpose of making the contemplated movement prompt action had to be taken and general grant rode on farther to the front accompanied by general meade and the members of their staffs to give orders on the spot as this group of mounted officers formed a conspicuous target the enemy was not slow to open upon it with his guns and soon the whistling of projectiles and the explosion of shells made the position rather uncomfortable one of our orderlies was killed and two were wounded it looked at one time as if the explosion of a shell had killed general meade but fortunately he escaped untouched a little speck of blood appeared on hancock's cheek after the bursting of a shell it was probably caused by a bit of gravel being thrown in his face staff officers were sent forward to the principal points to reconnoitre general grant as was his constant practice wished to see the exact position of the enemy with his own eyes he stopped the officers who were riding with him called on one aide-de-camp colonel babcock to accompany him and rode forward rapidly to within a few yards of the bridge before he had gone far a shell exploded just under his horse's neck the animal threw up his head and reared and it was thought that he and his rider had been struck but neither had been touched the enemy's batteries and sharpshooters were both firing and the situation was such that all the lookers-on experienced intense anxiety expecting every moment to see the general fall the telegraph lines had been cut and the twisted wires were lying about in confusion upon the ground to make matters more critical the general's horse got his foot caught in a loop of the wire and as the animal endeavoured to free himself the coil became twisted still tighter every one's face now began to wear a still more anxious look babcock whose coolness under fire was always conspicuous dismounted and carefully uncoiled the wire and released the horse the general sat still in his saddle evidently thinking more about the horse than of himself and in the most quiet and unruffled manner cautioned babcock to be sure not to hurt the animal's leg the general soon succeeded in obtaining a clear view of the enemy's line and the exact nature of the ground and then much to our relief retired to a less exposed position the advance of the troops was impeded by the dense underbrush the crookedness of the run the damming of its waters the slashed trees and other obstacles of every conceivable description which had been placed in the line of march it was seen by afternoon that an assault under the circumstances would not promise favorable results and it was abandoned the success of the operation depended upon reaching the objective point by a rapid movement and as unexpected obstacles were presented by the character of the country and by the weather instructions were now given to suspend operations and grant and meade rode to armstrong's mill general grant then took a narrow crossroad leading down to the run to the right of hancock's corps but it was soon found that there were no troops between our party and the enemy and that if we continued along this road it would probably not be many minutes before we should find ourselves prisoners in his lines there was nothing to do but to turn around and strike a road farther in the rear this as usual was a great annoyance to the general who expressed his objections as he had done many a time before to turning back we paused for a few minutes and tried to find some cross-cut but there was not even a pathway leading in the proper direction and the party had to retrace its steps for some distance general grant was now becoming anxious to get in telegraphic communication with butler and he rode on to a point on the military road called warren station reaching there about half past five p m after giving some further instructions to general meade he started back to city point on the way to general headquarters he discussed the events which had just taken place and said today's movement has resulted up to the time i left only in a reconnaissance in force i had hoped to accomplish more by means of it but it has at least given us a much more thorough knowledge of the country which with its natural and artificial obstacles is stronger than any one could have supposed this movement has convinced me of the next course which will have to be pursued it will be necessary for the army of the potomac to cut loose from its base leaving only a small force at city point and in front of petersburg to hold those positions the whole army can then swing completely round to the left and make lee's present position untenable 
there was some doubt in his mind as to what action the enemy would take in front of hancock and warren news came that evening showing that lee had assumed the offensive and that severe fighting had occurred between four and five o'clock a heavy force of the enemy passed between hancock and warren and made a vigorous assault on the right and rear of hancock's corps but hancock struck the enemy in flank threw him into confusion and gathered nine hundred prisoners and a number of colors the enemy was unable to reform his troops and did not attempt any further offensive operations this day's engagement is known as the battle of hatcher's run butler had sent a force to the north side of the james but the enemy retired to his entrenched works whenever our troops advanced against him and only one attack was made these operations closed for the winter the series of battles in front of petersburg and richmond cold weather and the condition of the roads rendering further important movements impractical while there was much skirmishing and some spirited fighting no more general engagements occurred until spring since my return from atlanta a number of communications have been exchanged between grant and sherman regarding the contemplated march to the sea jefferson davis had visited hood's headquarters and at different points on his trip had made speeches assuring the people that atlanta was to be retaken that sherman's communications were to be cut and that his retreat would be as disastrous as napoleon's retreat from moscow when general grant received the reports of these speeches which were widely published in the southern newspapers he remarked mr davis has not made it quite plain who is to furnish the snow for this moscow retreat through georgia and tennessee however he has rendered us one good service at least in notifying us of hood's intended plan of campaign in a short time it was seen that hood was marching his army against the railroad which constituted sherman's only line of communication with his base of supplies sherman now called for reinforcements and grant directed all recruits in the west to be sent to him on september twenty nine hood crossed the chattahoochee river this was the day on which grant made the movements herein before described against richmond and petersburg with a view to preventing lee from detaching any troops there were some who thought grant manifested unnecessary anxiety on this subject but it must be remembered that just one year before lee had sent longstreet's whole corps to northern georgia that it was not discovered until it was well on its way to join bragg's forces against rosecrans army at chickamauga and that it accomplished the reverse which occurred to our arms on that field besides grant's mind seemed always more concerned about preventing disasters to the armies of his distant commanders than to the troops under his own personal direction he was invariably generous to others and his self-reliance was so great that he always felt that he could take ample care of himself general rawlins had now returned and it was very gratifying to see that while his health was not restored it was greatly improved he still however was troubled with a cough the day he arrived general grant saw that he was still far from well and said with much distress when rawlins was out of earshot i do not like that cough when rawlins learned the plan proposed in regard to sherman's future movements he was seriously opposed to it and presented every possible argument against it rawlins always talked with great force he had a natural taste for public speaking and when he became particularly earnest in the discussion of a question his speech often took the form of an oration and as he grew more excited and his enthusiasm increased he would hold forth in stentorian tones and emphasize his remarks with vehement gesticulation and no end of expletives as i had been sent to confer with sherman and had studied the subject in all its bearings and felt absolute faith in the success of the movement i became the chief spokesman in its favor and many evenings were occupied in discussing the pros and cons of the contemplated movement the staff had in fact resolved itself into an animated debating society the general-in-chief would sit quietly by listening to the arguments and sometimes showed himself greatly amused by the vehemence of the debaters one night the discussion waxed particularly warm and was kept up for some time after the general had gone to bed about one o'clock he poked his head out of his tent and interrupted rawlins in the midst of an eloquent passage by crying out 
oh go to bed all of you you're keeping the whole camp awake rawlins had convinced himself that if hood kept his army in front of sherman's to bar his progress sherman having cut loose from his base would not be able to supply himself and his army would be destroyed and that on the other hand if hood turned north sherman's army would be unavailable and it would be difficult to assemble sufficient force to prevent hood from reaching the ohio river against this view it was argued that if hood decided to confront sherman to prevent his passage across the country sherman would always have a force large enough to whip him in a pitched battle or so threaten him as to compel him to keep his forces concentrated while sherman could throw detachments out from his flanks and rear and obtain plenty of provisions in a country which had never been ravaged by contending armies or if hood started north that sherman could detach a large force to send against him which when reinforced by the troops that could be hurried from missouri and other points would be amply able to take care of hood while sherman with the bulk of his army could cut the confederacy in two sever all its lines of communication and destroy its principal arsenals and factories in fact sherman was so far away from his base with only a single track railroad liable constantly to be broken by raiders that it became a necessity for him either to fall back or to go ahead rawlins was possessed of an earnest nature and was devoted to general grant's interests and his urgency against this movement was not a factious opposition for he had really convinced himself that nothing but an absolute calamity would be the result in this case general grant as usual paid but little attention to the opinions of others upon a purely military question about the advisability of which he really had no doubt in his own mind it was suggested one evening that he instruct sherman to hold a council of war on the subject of the next movement of his army to this general grant replied no i will not direct any one to do what i would not do myself under similar circumstances i never held what might be called formal councils of war and i do not believe in them they create a divided responsibility and at times prevent that unity of action so necessary in the field some officers will in all likelihood oppose any plan that may be adopted and when it is put into execution such officers may by their arguments in opposition have so far convinced themselves that the movement will fail that they cannot enter upon it with enthusiasm and might possibly be influenced in their actions by the feeling that a victory would be a reflection upon their judgment i believe it is better for a commander charged with the responsibility of all the operations of his army to consult his generals freely but informally get their views and opinions and then make up his mind what action to take and act accordingly there is too much truth in the old adage councils of war do not fight on october sixth general grant went to washington to consult with the authorities in regard to the raising of additional troops and to learn upon what number of reinforcements he could rely before deciding definitely upon the course to be pursued in the west hood had now turned north and was operating against sherman's railroad in his rear sherman had left the twentieth corps in atlanta to hold that place and had marched with the rest of his army as far north as marietta on october ten sherman telegraphed grant hood is now crossing the coosa twelve miles below rome bound west if he passes over to the mobile and ohio road had i not better execute the plan of my letter sent by colonel porter and leave general thomas with the troops now in tennessee to defend the state the situation was such however that general grant disliked to see a veteran army like sherman's marching away from hood without first crippling him and he replied to sherman the next day the eleventh saying among other things if you were to cut loose i do not believe you would meet hood's army but would be bushwhacked by all the old men little boys and such railroad guards as are still left at home hood would probably strike for nashville thinking by going north he could inflict greater damage upon us than we could upon the rebels by going south if there is any way of getting at hood's army i would prefer that but i must trust to your own judgment 
it will be seen from the above dispatch that grant's military foresight had enabled him to predict at this time precisely what afterward took place as to sherman's army not meeting hoods at the same hour at which grant wrote this dispatch at city point sherman had sent a telegram to him saying that he would prefer to start on his march to the sea and that he believed hood would be forced to follow him a little before midnight on the eleventh grant sent sherman the following reply your dispatch of to-day received if you are satisfied the trip to the sea-coast can be made holding the line of the tennessee firmly you may make it destroying all the railroads south of dalton or chattanooga as you think best general sherman informed me long after the war that he did not receive this reply which was accounted for no doubt by the fact that his telegraph wires were cut at that time he was ignorant of the existence of this dispatch when he wrote in his memoirs in eighteen seventy five that november second was the first time that general grant ordered the march to the sea general grant was now actively engaged in making additional preparations for sherman's reception on the sea-coast he directed that vessels should be loaded with abundant supplies and sail as soon as it became known that sherman had started across georgia and rendezvous at Osaba sound a short distance below the mouth of the savannah river on october twenty nine finding that the movement of the troops ordered from missouri to tennessee was exceedingly slow the general directed rawlins to go in person to st louis and confer with rosecrans the department commander and see that all haste was made the secretary of war now sent a telegram to general grant wishing him to reconsider his order authorizing the march to the sea in fact the president and the secretary had never been favorably impressed with sherman's contemplated movement and as early as october second halleck had written to general grant advocating a different plan grant felt that as there was so much hesitation in washington he ought once more to impress upon sherman the importance of dealing a crushing blow to hood's army if practicable before starting on his march eastward and telegraphed him accordingly to this sherman replied that if he pursued hood he would have to give up atlanta and that he preferred to strike out for the sea at eleven thirty a m november second before grant had received the above reply from sherman he sent another message to that officer closing with the words i really do not see that you can withdraw from where you are to follow hood without giving up all we have gained in territory i say then go as you propose several additional dispatches were interchanged and at ten thirty p m november seven grant telegraphed sherman i see no present reason for changing your plan should any arise you will see it or if i do will inform you i think everything here favorable now great good fortune attend you i believe you will be eminently successful and at worst can only make a march less fruitful of results than is hoped for the telegraph wires were soon after cut and no more dispatches could be sent it was not until the fifteenth that sherman was entirely ready to move on the morning of that day atlanta was abandoned and the famous march to the sea was begun extracts from the correspondence between the general-in-chief and the distinguished commander of the armies of the west and the views expressed by them regarding the conception and execution of this memorable movement are given in some detail in order to correct many erroneous impressions upon the subject overzealous partisans of general grant have claimed that he originated and controlled the entire movement while enthusiastic admirers of sherman have insisted that grant was surprised at the novelty of the suggestion and was at first opposed to the march and that sherman had to exert all his force of character to induce grant to consent to the campaign the truth is that the two generals were in perfect accord in this as in all other movements undertaken while grant was in supreme command of the armies these two distinguished officers acted in entire harmony and the movement reflects lasting credit upon both long before sherman's army started upon his atlanta campaign it was clear to grant and others with whom he discussed the matter that after that army reached a point in the interior of the south too far from its base to maintain a line of supplies communication would have to be opened up with the sea-coast and a new base established there 
sherman however is entitled to the exclusive credit of the plan of cutting loose entirely from his source of supplies moving a long distance through the enemy's country without a base and having in view several objective points upon which to direct his army his selection to depend upon the contingencies of the campaign it was the same sort of campaigning as that which grant had undertaken when operating in the rear of vicksburg general grant said more than once i want it to be recorded in history that sherman is entitled to the entire credit of the detailed plan of cutting loose from his base at atlanta and marching to savannah as to the brilliancy of the execution of the plan on sherman's part there can never be any dispute the plan was entirely in accord with my views as to the general cooperation of our widely separated armies he approved the suggestions at the start in spite of the doubts expressed by army officers about him and by some of the authorities at washington he encouraged and aided sherman in all the work of preparation and when the time for final action came he promptly gave his consent to the undertaking about the only point upon which their military judgments differed was as to the action of hood grant being firmly convinced that he would turn north while sherman thought their armies might encounter each other End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one grant suggests a plan for voting in the field grant visits new york a philadelphia ovation to grant grant and lincoln in conference grant's winter quarters at city point general ingall's spotted dog grant's intercourse with his associates correspondence with general thomas the presidential election was now approaching and provisions were being carried out for receiving the ballots of the soldiers who came from those states which had passed laws authorizing their soldiers in the field to cast their votes general grant had been consulted in regard to the propriety and the practicability of permitting the soldiers to vote and he had written a letter which contains such broad principles of statesmanship and exhibits so much foresight as to the checks and restraints with which the matter should be guarded and produced so profound an impression at the time that it is given in full city point virginia september twenty seventh eighteen sixty four the hon e m stanton secretary of war washington d c the exercise of the right of suffrage by the officers and soldiers of armies in the field is a novel thing it has i believe generally been considered dangerous to constitutional liberty and subversive of military discipline but our circumstances are novel and exceptional a very large proportion of the legal voters of the united states are now either under arms in the field or in hospitals or otherwise engaged in the military service of the united states most of these men are not regular soldiers in the strict sense of that term still less are they mercenaries who give their services to the government simply for its pay having little understanding of political questions or feeling little or no interest in them on the contrary they are american citizens having still their homes and social and political ties binding them to the states and districts from which they come and to which they expect to return they have left their homes temporarily to sustain the cause of their country in the hour of its trial in performing this sacred duty they should not be deprived of a most precious privilege they have as much right to demand that their vote shall be counted in the choice of their rulers as those citizens who remain at home nay more for they have sacrificed more for their country i state these reasons in full for the unusual thing of allowing armies in the field to vote that i may urge on the other hand that nothing more than the fullest exercise of this right should be allowed for anything not absolutely necessary to this exercise cannot but be dangerous to the liberties of the country the officers and soldiers have every means of understanding the questions before the country the newspapers are freely circulated and so i believe are the documents prepared by both parties to set forth the merits and claims of their candidates beyond this nothing whatever should be allowed no political meetings no harangues from soldiers or citizens and no canvassing of camps or regiments for votes 
i see not why a single individual not belonging to the armies should be admitted into their lines to deliver tickets in my opinion the tickets should be furnished by the chief provost marshal of every army by them to the provost marshal or some other appointed officer of each brigade or regiment who shall on the day of election deliver tickets irrespective of party to whoever may call for them if however it shall be deemed expedient to admit citizens to deliver tickets then it should be most positively prohibited that such citizens should electioneer harangue or canvass the regiments in any way their business should be and only be to distribute on a certain fixed day tickets to whoever may call for them in the case of those states whose soldiers vote by proxy proper state authority could be given to officers belonging to regiments so voting to receive and forward votes as it is intended that all soldiers entitled to vote shall exercise that privilege according to their own convictions of right unmolested and unrestricted there will be no objection to each party sending to armies easy of access a number of respectable gentlemen to see that these views are fully carried out to the army at atlanta and those armies on the sea-coast from new Bern to new orleans not to exceed three citizens of each party should be admitted u s grant lieutenant-general fourteen of the loyal states authorized their troops in the field to vote general grant felt that he was simply a soldier and he took no active part in the political campaign although he never failed to let it be known that he ardently desired the triumph of the party which was in favor of vigorously prosecuting the war to a successful termination he had been exceedingly annoyed by the fact that the missouri state convention had instructed its delegates to the national convention which nominated lincoln to cast their twenty-two votes for ulysses s grant and exerted what influence he could not to have his name mentioned in any way in the convention but as the delegates had received instructions they felt that they could not disobey them the hon john f hume chairman of the missouri delegation therefore cast the votes of his state for general grant but before the result of the ballot was announced he changed them to mr lincoln general grant did not have an opportunity to vote at the election as his state illinois had made no provision for allowing her soldiers at the front to cast their ballots on the eighth of november the presidential election took place the voting passed off very quietly in the camps every soldier was allowed absolute freedom in the choice of candidates and perhaps no election had ever been conducted with greater fairness the soldiers vote in favor of lincoln over mcclellan was in the proportion of more than three to one general grant strolled through some of the neighboring camps while the voting was going on and watched with interest how quietly and effectively the system for depositing the ballots worked on the tenth of november enough was known at headquarters to make it plain that lincoln was elected that night grant telegraphed to halleck congratulate the president for me for the double victory the election having passed off quietly no bloodshed or riot throughout the land is a victory worth more to the country than a battle won general grant had a marked aversion to interfering in any matters which pertain to the civil administration of the government he had contented himself with sending to points in the north such troops as were really necessary as precautionary steps and had left it entirely to the war department to carry out measures for arresting and punishing the confederate emissaries in the loyal states and breaking up the bands of conspirators who were plotting against the government considering the positions of the armies of sherman and thomas general grant was still anxious that lee should send no troops to the west and he determined to watch him closely but not to make any move which might have the effect of inducing him to evacuate richmond and petersburg as the apprehension throughout the north had been allayed and as there were no operations in contemplation in virginia general grant started on the seventeenth of november and made a short trip to burlington new jersey to see his children who had been placed at school there and his wife who was with them there went with the party an expert telegraph operator familiar with the cipher used in official dispatches who was used in keeping up telegraphic communication with the front 
on november nineteen news was received at headquarters through confederate sources that lee had recalled early's command from the valley of virginia this was instantly communicated to the general-in-chief he telegraphed at once to sheridan mentioning this news and saying that if he was satisfied that it was so to send wright's corps to city point without delay and move with his cavalry to cut the virginia central railroad there was destined to be no respite for the general-in-chief even while snatching a couple of days rest in the quiet of his little family he was still called on to direct important movements in the field finding that there was no immediate need of his presence at the front he decided to run over to new york for a couple of days he had promised mrs grant to go there on a shopping expedition and he also felt some curiosity to take a look at the city as he had not seen it since he was graduated from the military academy twenty-one years before he went with mrs grant to the astor house quietly and unannounced being particularly desirous of avoiding any public demonstrations he did not realize however the sensation which his arrival in the metropolis would create the news spread rapidly throughout the city and the greatest eagerness was manifested on the part of the people to get a sight of the famous commander the foremost citizens presented themselves at the hotel to pay their respects to him and enthusiastic crowds filled the streets and stood for hours gazing at the windows of his rooms in the hope of catching a glimpse of him entertainments of every kind were tendered him and invitations poured in from every quarter he received many prominent citizens in his rooms and had a great many interesting talks with them but the invitations to entertainments were declined and all public demonstrations avoided as much as possible the next morning after his arrival the general strolled out into the streets with a former staff officer then living in new york and being in plain citizen's clothes was for some time unobserved but finally his features which had been made known by means of the portraits everywhere displayed were recognized and finding a crowd surrounding him he stepped into a street car the gentleman with him finding no vacant seat asked the conductor to have the people sit closer together and make room for general grant the conductor put on a broad grin and quietly winked one eye as much as to say you can't fool me with such a cock-and-bull story as that and the general quietly took hold of a strap and rode throughout the trip standing with a number of others who had crowded into the car after remaining two days in the city seeing what little he could at that time of the vast improvements which had taken place since he was last there he started for washington but on the way decided to remain over a day in philadelphia after he had spent a little while at the continental hotel he attempted to take a walk down chestnut street but his features had become as familiar to the people of the quaker city as to the new yorkers and he was promptly recognized and his name was passed from mouth to mouth in the street soon the people rushed out in crowds from the stores on both sides of the way and curiosity was on tiptoe to see him first those near by took off their hats to him then they crowded up to shake hands then applause was started along the sidewalks and soon cheer after cheer arose he was now near independence hall and the crowd in its good nature and enthusiasm pressed upon him so vigorously that he was compelled to take refuge in the building his presence was then announced to the mayor who set to work hurriedly to improvise a reception the news of the commander's presence had spread in the meantime like wildfire and a dense mass of people had crowded into the hall in their eagerness to shake hands with him they soon lost all restraint and many were in danger of being injured in the crush his friends now induced him to consent to an act which his enemies had never succeeded in compelling him to perform to beat a retreat he was conducted from the hall by a private exit placed in a carriage and the coachman was directed to drive rapidly back to the hotel in this flank movement however the general did not meet with the success which had crowned his efforts in the field the admiring crowd of people soon discovered his change of base and those in front being pressed on by those in rear surged up against the carriage checking its movement breaking some of the windows and nearly toppling it over never had there been a greater necessity for the prayer save me from my friends 
finally however the hotel was safely reached the general treated the matter throughout with his accustomed good nature and his usual calmness in the entire mass of people he was perhaps the only one unexcited and unruffled the only feeling he exhibited was one of intense surprise that he should attract so much attention he then proceeded to washington and on november twenty three called upon the president and the secretary of war and had extended interviews with them one object in his going to washington was to make a determined effort to obtain promotion for his officers who had made themselves conspicuous for their gallantry and efficiency in the field in order to create the necessary vacancies he recommended that the inefficient general officers be mustered out of service and gave a list of eight major generals and thirty-three brigadiers whose services the government could dispense with to advantage in the matter of relieving these useless officers the general was entirely impartial as the list contained a number of his warm personal friends the president said to him why i find that lots of the officers on this list are very close friends of yours do you want them all dropped the general replied that's very true mr president but my personal friends are not always good generals and i think it but just to adhere to my recommendation the secretary of war had impaired his health by his incessant labors and by his positive and sometimes arbitrary conduct had created an opposition to himself in many quarters and there were rumors at this time that he might retire from his position this subject was brought up by the president in his conversation with the general-in-chief and he was considerate enough to say that in case such a change should occur he would not appoint another secretary without giving the general an opportunity to express his views as to the selection general grant took occasion to say to mr lincoln at this interview i doubt very much whether you could select as efficient a secretary of war as the present incumbent he is not only a man of untiring energy and devotion to duty but even his worst enemies never for a moment doubt his personal integrity and the purity of his motives and it tends largely to reconcile the people to the heavy taxes they are paying when they feel an absolute certainty that the chief of the department which is giving out contracts for countless millions of dollars is a person of scrupulous honesty the general now returned to city point feeling much gratified with his visit to washington and well satisfied with what he had accomplished while there general hancock was suffering so intensely from his wounds that he was given a leave of absence for twenty days it being hoped that at the end of that time he might be better but he was unable to return and general a a humphreys thereafter commanded the second corps his assignment was dated november twenty five he was a most accomplished officer and by his talents and his personal gallantry had already won great distinction his appointment was recognized as eminently fitting and met with favor throughout the entire army the camp at city point had now given place to winter quarters for in view of the character of the campaigns that were to be conducted by our armies in the west and south it was decided to make no immediate attempt to dislodge lee's army from petersburg and richmond and preparations were made by the general-in-chief to pass the winter months at city point the tents which were much worn had become very uncomfortable as the cold weather set in and they were removed and log huts were erected in their stead each hut contained space enough for bunks for two officers and had a small door in front a window on each side and an open fireplace at the rear end general grant's hut was as plain as the others and was constructed with a sitting-room in front and a small apartment used as a bedroom in rear with a communicating door between them an iron camp bed an iron washstand a couple of pine tables and a few common wooden chairs constituted the furniture the floor was entirely bare there were many comments in the newspapers about this time upon the preparations for winter's quarters one comic paper had a picture of the general's hut with smoke curling out of the chimney and under it the words grant fought it out on this line though it took him all summer and has now sent for his stove papers inimical to the cause gave the establishment of winter quarters as a proof that the oldest inhabitant would not be likely to live long enough to see grant enter richmond 
some of the jocose remarks referring to this subject displayed no little wit and many of them were a source of considerable amusement to the general and those about him general ingalls had just returned from a trip to washington and brought with him an english spotted coach dog which followed him everywhere through camp and attracted no end of attention a dog of any kind was rather an unusual sight in an army in the field and an animal of the peculiar marks and aristocratic bearing of ingalls companion excited widespread remark every time the dog came to headquarters general grant was certain to comment upon the animal and perpetrate some good-natured joke at the expense of his classmate the dog followed the usual canine custom and expressed his feelings by an agitation of his caudal appendage to describe his actions astronomically it may be said that he indicated anger by imparting to his tail a series of longitudinal vibrations and pleasure by giving it a gentle motion in azimuth familiarly known as a wag one evening as the general was sitting in front of his quarters ingalls came up to have a chat with him and was followed by the dog which sat down in the usual place at his master's feet the animal squatted upon its hindquarters, licked its chops, pricked up its ears, and looked first at one officer and then at the other, as if to say, I am General Ingalls' dog. Whose pup are you? In the course of his remarks, General Grant took a look at the animal and said, Well, Ingalls, what are your real intentions in regard to that dog? Do you expect to take it into Richmond with you? Ingalls, who was noted for his dry humor, replied with mock seriousness and an air of extreme patience, I hope so. It is said to come from a long-lived breed. This retort, coupled with the comical attitude of the dog at the time, turned the laugh upon the general, who joined heartily in the merriment and seemed to enjoy the joke as much as any of the party while the general's manners were simple and unconstrained and his conversation with his staff was of the most sociable nature yet he always maintained a dignity of demeanour which set bounds to any undue familiarity on the part of those who held intercourse with him however close they were to him and their relations there was never any obtrusive intimacy he always addressed his chief of staff as rawlins general sherman as sherman and usually called his cavalry leader sheridan but in addressing meade and nearly all the other commanders he invariably employed the title general sherman always called the general-in-chief grant in public and private conversation ingalls and other classmates used this term in talking with him alone but when others were present they gave him his military title all other officers in the service addressed him invariably as general in conversation with his personal aides who had served intimately with him he would call them sometimes by their last names and at other times by their military titles he was scrupulously careful under all circumstances not to neglect the little courtesies which are the stamp of genuine politeness when a general officer came to his headquarters the general-in-chief always rose to receive him shook hands and invited him to sit down if smoking at the time he offered the visitor a cigar and if it was near the hour for a meal invited him to be a guest at the mess he never made any remarks in criticism of a person who had called on him after the visitor had left and by his manner always showed an objection to hearing others talk about people behind their backs he never had the slightest fondness for gossip of any kind whenever any one attempted to whisper to him in the presence of others while he did not openly rebuke the offender he always managed in some way to make it evident that the practice was distasteful to him usually when any one came close to him and started to communicate with him in a whisper before company he drew slightly back and at once began to reply in a loud tone of voice which was a sufficient indication that he regarded the whispering as an impoliteness if there was really any reason for a confidential interview he would proceed to his back room and hold it there his conduct was particularly courteous in the presence of ladies and he never neglected those little attentions to their sex which constitute true politeness 
if he were reclining on a bench or sitting in a lounging attitude in a chair after a fatiguing day when any lady approached whether a visitor or a person of his own household he would at once assume a more deferential position and show her every possible courtesy the general's mind was much absorbed at this time in the movements of sherman and thomas sherman was marching rapidly into the interior of georgia cut off from all communication the general in speaking of the movement one evening said sherman's army is now somewhat in the condition of a ground mole when he disappears under a lawn you can here and there trace his track but you are not quite certain where he will come out till you see his head hood had abandoned georgia to sherman and was moving north with his whole force against thomas his army now consisted of about forty five thousand men schofield who under thomas's orders was in advance watching hood's movements and endeavoring to delay him had less than twenty five thousand troops on november thirty hood closed up on schofield and attacked him this brought on the desperate battle of franklin and the fighting continued until long after nightfall the enemy was handsomely repulsed with a loss of over six thousand men while schofield lost only two thousand three hundred and twenty six this day was made still more eventful by reason of sherman's capturing millen georgia at the same time that schofield was achieving his signal victory in tennessee the night of the battle of franklin thomas was reinforced at nashville by two divisions from missouri and the next day by two divisions of his own troops that he had brought in from the front the day after the battle of franklin december one general thomas reported that he had retired to the fortifications around nashville until he could get his cavalry equipped which was then outnumbered by that of the enemy four to one adding that if hood attacked that position he would be seriously damaged and if he made no attack until our cavalry could be equipped he or schofield would move against him at once general grant telegraphed thomas on december two if hood is permitted to remain quietly about nashville you will lose all the road back to chattanooga and possibly have to abandon the line of the tennessee should he attack you it is all well but if he does not you should attack him before he fortifies arm and put in the trenches your quartermaster's employees citizens etc nashville was a large military depot where there were nearly ten thousand employees mainly quartermaster's men the same day the secretary of war telegraphed grant the president feels solicitous about the disposition of general thomas to lay in fortifications for an indefinite period until wilson gets equipments this looks like the mcclellan and rosecrans strategy of do nothing and let the rebels raid the country the president wishes you to consider the matter that afternoon the general sent a second dispatch to general thomas urging him to dispose of hood as speedily as possible and if he got him to retreating to give him no peace general thomas replied at some length stating his weak condition and recalling the fact that his command was made up of sherman's two weakest corps and all his dismounted cavalry except one brigade and he also called his attention to the delays made necessary by the task of reorganization and equipment he said that his cavalry was still outnumbered four to one but that he had just received reinforcements of infantry and now had infantry enough though not sufficient cavalry to assume the offensive but that he expected more cavalry and in a few days more should be able to give hood another fight general grant's instructions had been put in the form of suggestions thus far as he was reluctant to give positive orders he entertained a high regard for general thomas personally and the greatest respect for his military capacity thomas was a conspicuous representative of the loyal virginians at the breaking out of the war he had shown great strength of character and determination of purpose in deciding to remain loyal to the country which had educated him as a soldier and to defend the flag which he had sworn to uphold no one had displayed greater devotion to the cause and few officers in the service stood higher in the affection of their associates or in the confidence of their superior officers general thomas being in command of only a single army looked naturally to the means of securing the largest measure of success in his immediate front 
and it was not likely that he would regard time as of so much importance as the general-in-chief of all the armies with grant the movements of thomas's army were a part of a series of cooperative campaigns and unnecessary delays in the movements of any one army might seriously affect contemplated operations on the part of the others canby was expected to send a force into the interior but he could not do so until thomas had assumed the offensive against hood and he was compelled to postpone his expedition and to hold vicksburg and memphis and patrol the mississippi to try to prevent troops from crossing from the trans mississippi department to relieve hood on december three general thomas described the situation further and closed by saying that he would feel able to march against hood in less than a week the seat of war in the west had been transferred from atlanta as far north as nashville and general grant now became apprehensive that hood would cross the cumberland river move into kentucky and cut thomas's railroad communications and that the theater of operations in that region might be transferred even to the ohio river the disastrous moral effect of which would be beyond calculation general thomas telegraphed december sixth that he thought he ought to have six thousand cavalry mounted before attacking hood and hoped to have such a mounted force in three days general grant's anxiety was increased by the fact that he realized that the inclement season was at hand and feared that the winter storms might appear at any time and prove unfavorable for attack thomas had concentrated the forces in his department troops had been hurried forward from missouri and the cavalry was being remounted by general james h wilson with great energy End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two planning the first fort fisher expedition grant's aversion to liars reminiscences of grant's cadet life grant orders thomas to move against hood thomas crushes hood decisions of the utmost importance had to be made at this time in regard to movements on foot in other directions the enemy was found to be making desperate efforts to collect troops to stay the progress of sherman whose march was creating the greatest consternation in the state of georgia news received from prisoners and spies as well as from southern newspapers all confirmed the rumor that sherman was destroying large quantities of supplies essential to the enemy and striking terror at all points on his line of march the governors of five southern states were sending their reserves to confront sherman and the garrison of fort fisher near wilmington north carolina was largely reduced for the same purpose the latter news now made the general-in-chief anxious to start the expedition which he had in contemplation against wilmington this port had become the principal resort for vessels running the blockade and was of incalculable importance to the enemy on account of the supplies received from foreign countries a large fleet of naval vessels had been put under the command of admiral porter and a force of sixty five hundred men of butler's army was held in readiness to be placed upon transports and sent to the south of the cape fear river under the command of general weitzel to cooperate with the fleet in capturing fort fisher the formidable earthenwork which constituted the main defence of the mouth of the cape fear river and the city of wilmington general butler who was always prolific in ideas made an original suggestion in regard to this expedition which he believed would accomplish immensely important results his proposition was to load a vessel with powder tow it up as near as possible to fort fisher and explode it in the hope of shaking up the fort so seriously that its parapet would be sufficiently injured greatly to weaken its defences admiral porter and other naval authorities seemed to favor the project and general grant finally agreed to let the experiment be tried although his own judgment was decidedly against it he said in speaking of it whether the report will be sufficient even to wake up the garrison in the fort if they happen to be asleep at the time of the explosion i do not know it is at least foolish to think that the effect of the explosion could be transmitted to such a distance with enough force to weaken the fort 
however they can use an old boat which is not of much value and we have plenty of damaged powder which is unserviceable for any other purpose so that the experiment will not cost much at any rate mr lincoln in assenting to it said facetiously we might as well explode the notion with powder as with anything else on december three general grant wrote sherman a letter which he sent down the coast to be delivered as soon as the western commander reached the sea in the vicinity of savannah in which he said bragg has gone from wilmington i am trying to take advantage of his absence to get possession of that place owing to some preparations that admiral porter and general butler are making to blow up fort fisher and which while i hope for the best i do not believe a particle in there is a delay in getting the expedition off as thomas's army was now larger than hood's and splendidly officered grant was much disturbed at the delay in striking hood and his anxiety had become so great that at four p m on december six he telegraphed thomas attack hood at once and wait no longer for a remount of your cavalry there is great danger of delay resulting in a campaign back to the ohio river thomas replied at nine o'clock that night i will make the necessary disposition and attack hood at once agreeably to your order though i believe it will be hazardous with the small force of cavalry now at my service news had been received that hood was moving a force toward harpeth shoals on the cumberland that night weitzel's troops embarked for the fort fisher expedition butler came over to headquarters and announced his purpose of accompanying the expedition this was the first intimation the general had that butler was ambitious to go in person with the troops as it was not the intention that he should command grant had selected in weitzel an officer whom he regarded as peculiarly qualified for the management of such a delicate undertaking however it would have been under the circumstances a mortal affront to prevent the commander of the troops and of the department in which they were operating from accompanying them and the alternative was presented to general grant's mind of either letting butler go on the expedition or relieving him from duty altogether butler placed great reliance upon the explosion of the powder boat and had counted upon being present at the attack and finally the general-in-chief rather than wound his feelings at such a crisis did not order him to remain behind he felt that weitzel would have immediate command of the attacking party general grant now wrote instructions to sherman directing him to move his army by sea to richmond it appearing to him under all the circumstances at that time that it would be the means of dealing a death-blow to the confederacy and to prove the quickest method of bringing the war to a close late that night the general rawlins ingalls and i with one or two others were sitting by the campfire the general was seated on a rustic bench as usual and was wrapped in his blue overcoat he loved the open air and nothing but a rainstorm could drive him into his hut some camp rumors had just been received which bore on their face the assurance that they were manufactured out of whole cloth the discussion which ensued led the general to relate a story which was particularly well told he said there was a man at the same post with me who had such a propensity for lying that his example taught every one a lesson as to the evil and absurdity of the practice he seemed to believe that a lie told with particularity was more convincing than a general truth but he frequently tripped himself up on account of his bad memory for in order to be a successful liar a man ought to have a good memory one day there were some strangers invited to dinner and the champion was urged to try and keep as far within reasonable bounds in his statements as possible so as not to mortify the company more than was necessary this he promised and evidently in good faith for he asked an officer to touch his foot under the table if he told anything that might to unimaginative persons appear to be an exaggeration before the soup was finished however he began to indulge in his munchausisms a person at the table mentioned the existing tendency to build hotels larger and larger every year the champion joined in the conversation by saying but it's not a new thing after all as long ago as when i was a mere boy my father built a bigger hotel in our place than anybody has ever attempted since 
about how big was it asked one of the strangers why was the answer it was two hundred and ninety-six feet high five hundred and eighty feet long and here the officer kicked his foot under the table and he continued in a more subdued tone of voice and five feet and a half wide after the laughter which followed this story had ceased the general arose from his seat threw away the stump of his cigar and said well i think i'll turn in good night and retired to his sleeping apartment after he had gone rollins remarked the general always likes to tell an anecdote that points a moral on the subject of lying he hates only two kinds of people liars and cowards he has no patience with them and never fails to show his aversion for them ingalls added such traits are so foreign to his own nature that it is not surprising that he should not tolerate them in others as man and boy he has always been the most absolutely truthful person in the whole range of my acquaintance i never knew him to run into the slightest exaggeration or to borrow in the least degree from his imagination in relating an occurrence one of the party remarked i was amused one day to hear an officer say that the general was a tediously truthful he explained that what he meant by that was that the general in mentioning something that had taken place would direct his mind so earnestly to stating unimportant details with entire accuracy that he would mar the interest of the story for instance after returning from a walk around camp he would say i was told so and so about the wounded by dr blank while we were talking this morning inside of his tent and a half hour afterward he would take the trouble to come back and say as if it were a matter of the greatest importance i was mistaken when i told you that my conversation with dr blank occurred inside his tent that was not correct it took place while we were standing in front of his tent there was much truth in this comment no one who had served any time with the general could fail to be struck with his excellent memory and the pains he invariably took to state the occurrences with positive accuracy even in the most unimportant particulars when he became president an usher brought him a card one day while he was in a private room writing a message to congress shall i tell the gentleman you are not in asked the usher no answered the president you will say nothing of the kind i don't lie myself and i won't have any one lie for me a staff officer inquired of ingalls whether general grant when at west point gave any promise of his future greatness ingalls replied grant was such a quiet unassuming fellow when a cadet that nobody would have picked him out as one who was destined to occupy a conspicuous place in history and yet he had certain qualities which attracted attention and commanded the respect of all those in the corps with him he was always frank generous and manly at cavalry drill he excelled every one in his class he used to take great delight in mounting and breaking in the most intractable of the new horses that were purchased from time to time and put in the squad he succeeded in this not by punishing the animal he had taken in hand but by patience and tact and his skill in making the creature know what he wanted to have it do he was a particularly daring jumper in the jumping hurdles when grant's turn came the soldiers in attendance would at an indication from him raise the top bar a foot or so higher than usual and he would generally manage to clear it in his studies he was lazy and careless instead of studying a lesson he would merely read it over once or twice but he was so quick in his perceptions that he usually made very fair recitations even with so little preparation his memory was not at all good in an attempt to learn anything by heart accurately and this made his grade low in those branches of study which required a special effort of the memory in scientific subjects he was very bright and if he had labored hard he would have stood very high in them our class had sixty members the first year but eight failed to pass the examinations and the number was reduced to fifty-two the second year's course had in it the hardest mathematics grant's grade in that branch was number ten the next year he stood fifteen in natural philosophy which stumped so many of us and in the graduating year he was sixteen in engineering the principal study of the first class course 
he was rather slouchy and unmilitary at infantry drills and received about the average number of demerits the principal reputation he gained among his fellow cadets was for common sense good judgment entire unselfishness and absolute fairness in everything he did when we would get into an excited dispute over any subject it was a very common thing to say well suppose we see what sam grant has to say about it and leave it to his decision he had been given the nickname of uncle sam from his initials and this was often shortened into sam as i said while he was not by any means conspicuous in the class and never sought to be he had enough marked characteristics to prevent him from being considered commonplace and every one associated with him was sure to remember him and retain a high regard for him the anxiety of the authorities at washington had now become so intense regarding thomas's delay that grant became more anxious than ever to have prompt action taken in tennessee on the morning of december seven stanton sent a dispatch to city point saying thomas seems unwilling to attack because it is hazardous as if all war was anything but hazardous the government was throwing the entire responsibility upon general grant and really censuring him in its criticisms of thomas grant telegraphed to washington there is no better man to repel an attack than thomas but i fear he is too cautious to take the initiative on the eighth he sent a long dispatch to general thomas urging him strenuously to attack picturing the consequences which might follow longer delay and appealing to his pride and patriotism he wound up by saying now is one of the finest opportunities ever presented of destroying one of the three armies of the enemy if destroyed he can never replace it use the means at your command and you can do this and cause a rejoicing that will resound from one end of the land to another the next morning halleck too telegraphed thomas urging him to wait no longer and saying that if he delayed till all the cavalry was mounted he would wait till doomsday as the waste was equaling the supply on the eighth grant learned that there was still no certainty as to when an attack would be made and he telegraphed to halleck though with much reluctance saying that if thomas had not struck yet he ought to be ordered to hand over his command to schofield to this halleck replied if you wish general thomas relieved give the order no one here will i think interfere the responsibility however will be yours as no one here so far as i am informed wishes general thomas's removal grant replied to halleck that he would not ask to have thomas relieved until he heard further from him while the authorities at washington were prodding grant demanding of him an immediate and vigorous movement in tennessee and shaping a correspondence which would have thrown all the blame on him if hood had passed around thomas and moved north yet when severe measures were to be taken general grant was promptly informed that he must assume all responsibility for any seemingly harsh treatment he was however the last man to be timid about shouldering responsibilities however disagreeable and he was not acting upon the goadings received from washington but upon his own military judgment on december nine at one p m thomas sent a telegram to grant saying your dispatch of eight thirty p m of the eighth is just received i had nearly completed my preparations to attack the enemy to-morrow morning but a terrible storm of freezing rain has come on to-day which will make it impossible for our men to fight to any advantage i am therefore compelled to wait for the storm to break and make the attack immediately after admiral lee is patrolling the river above and below the city and i believe will be able to prevent the enemy from crossing there is no doubt but that hood's forces are considerably scattered along the river with the view of attempting a crossing but it has been impossible for me to organize and equip the troops for an attack at an earlier time major general halleck informs me that you are very much dissatisfied with my delay in attacking i can only say i have done all in my power to prepare and if you should deem it necessary to relieve me i shall submit without a murmur nothing could better illustrate the nobility of thomas's character and his unselfishness and devotion to duty than the words of this dispatch it was dignified in tone and entirely subordinate in spirit 
while the general fully appreciated the manly character of the dispatch it was nevertheless a grievous disappointment to him he had felt that in war delays are always dangerous and there is no telling what adverse circumstances may occur meanwhile his worst apprehensions were now realized the season was far into the winter and a freezing storm had set in which might prove a serious disadvantage to general thomas's army rumors were abroad that hood confidently expected reinforcements from the trans mississippi department and these might now reach him before the coming battle general grant replied to general thomas at seven thirty p m that day i have as much confidence in your conducting a battle rightly as i have in any other officer but it has seemed to me that you have been slow and i have had no explanation of affairs to convince me otherwise receiving your dispatch of two p m from general halleck before i did the one to me i telegraphed to suspend the order relieving you until we should hear further i hope most sincerely that there will be no necessity of repeating the order and that the facts will show that you have been right all the time notwithstanding the radical difference in judgment between the general and his distinguished subordinate he was willing to give every reasonable consideration to his views and even to express the hope that events might prove that he was wrong and thomas right that night thomas telegraphed to both grant and halleck explaining his condition and saying that the storm continued still no attack was made and general grant curbed his impatience and hoped to hear from hour to hour that his orders would be obeyed without further urging he forbore from further suggestions until four p m on the eleventh when he telegraphed thomas the following if you delay attack longer the mortifying spectacle will be witnessed of a rebel army moving for the ohio river and you will be forced to act excepting such weather as you find let there be no further delay hood cannot stand even a drawn battle so far from his supplies of ordnance stores if he retreats and you follow he must lose his material and much of his army i am in hopes of receiving a dispatch from you to-day announcing that you have moved delay no longer for weather or reinforcements to add to general grant's discomfort butler's expedition had not yet got off from fort monroe for fort fisher this gave the general-in-chief anxiety for the reason that news was received this day from the richmond papers of the day before that sherman's advance was within twenty-five miles of savannah and that he was approaching at the rate of about eighteen miles a day grant felt that if the enemy were driven from savannah troops would be sent back to fort fisher and that garrison strengthened sufficiently to make the success of any assault upon it doubtful besides by this delay our expedition was losing the chance of surprise he therefore telegraphed butler urging him to start immediately the only good news received at headquarters upon this important day was the information that a movement made by warren had been successful he had destroyed the weldon railroad from nottoway river to hicksford with but little loss and his troops were now on their return to the army of the potomac grant promptly telegraphed the situation to sheridan and impressed upon him the importance of destroying the roads north of richmond in furtherance of the plan of cutting off the supplies of that city the next morning a reply came from thomas to grant's last dispatch saying that he would obey the orders as promptly as possible but the country was covered with a sheet of ice and sleet and the attack would be made under every disadvantage about four hours afterward he telegraphed again that the condition of the country was no better and it was impossible for cavalry or even infantry to move in anything like order and he thought that an attack would result only in a useless sacrifice of life another day of anxiety passed and another telegram came saying that there was no change in the weather at twelve thirty p m on the fourteenth halleck telegraphed thomas from washington reiterating that it was felt that every delay on his part seriously interfered with the general plans the past week had been one of the most anxious period of grant's entire military career and he suffered mental torture 
on the one hand he felt that he was submitting to delays which might seriously interfere with his general plans that he was placed in an attitude in which he was virtually incapable of having his most positive orders carried out and that he was occupying a position of almost insubordination to the authorities at washington on the other hand he realized that nothing but the most extreme case imaginable should lead him to do even a seeming injustice to a distinguished and capable commander by relieving him when he was on the eve of a decided victory for his military instincts convinced him that nothing but victory could follow the moment that thomas moved and he wished that loyal and devoted army commander to reap all the laurels of such a triumph however there was yet no time named for the attack and grant felt himself compelled to take some further steps general john a logan happened to be at this time on a visit to headquarters at city point logan had served under general grant in the west and held a high place in his estimation as a vigorous fighter the general talked over the situation with logan and finally directed him to start at once for nashville with a view to putting him in command of the operations there provided upon his arrival it was still found that no attack had been made he gave him the requisite order in writing to be used if necessary and told him to say nothing about it but to telegraph his arrival at nashville and if it was found that thomas had already moved not to deliver it or act upon it logan started promptly for the west it was now december fourteen and general grant being still more exercised in mind over the situation determined to carry out a design which he had had in view for several days to proceed to nashville and take command there in person the only thing which had prevented him from doing this earlier was the feeling which always dominated him in similar cases and made him shrink from having even the appearance of receiving the credit of a victory the honour of which he preferred to have fall upon a subordinate he now thought that his taking command in person would avoid the necessity of relieving thomas and be much less offensive to that officer than superseding him by some one else general grant therefore started for washington that night the fourteenth when he arrived there the next evening as soon as the steamboat touched the wharf a dispatch of the night before was shown him from thomas to halleck saying that the enemy would be attacked in the morning and also a telegram of the fifteenth from van duzer a superintendent of the military telegraph lines announcing that thomas had attacked the enemy early that morning driving him back at all points this was an incalculable relief to the general and lifted a heavy load from his mind he at once telegraphed thomas i was just on my way to nashville but receiving a dispatch from van duzer detailing your splendid success of to-day i shall go no farther push the enemy now and give him no rest until he is entirely destroyed your army will cheerfully suffer many privations to break up hood's army and render it useless for further operations do not stop for trains or supplies but take them from the country as the enemy has done much is now expected the general had scarcely arrived at his hotel when a dispatch came in from thomas saying i attacked the enemy's left this morning and drove it from the river below the city very nearly to the franklin pike distance about eight miles before the general went to bed he sent a reply to thomas dated midnight as follows your dispatch of this evening just received i congratulate you and the army under your command for to-day's operations and feel a conviction that to-morrow will add more fruits to your victory mr lincoln on hearing the news telegraphed thomas you have made a magnificent beginning a grand consummation is within your easy reach do not let it slip logan had proceeded as far as louisville when he heard the news of thomas's first day's fight grant received a telegram from him there saying people here jubilant over thomas's success confidence seems to be restored all things going right it would seem best that i return to join my command with sherman the general sent him a reply saying the news from thomas so far is in the highest degree gratifying you need not go farther general grant was now a much happier man than he had been for many weeks happy not only over the victory but because it had at last come in time to spare him from resorting to extreme measures 
regarding one of his most trusted lieutenants he went from washington to burlington spent a day with his family where a general rejoicing took place over the good news from tennessee and then returned to city point it was not until the seventeenth that the full details of thomas's victory were received his army from the very outset of the battle had charged the enemy so vigorously at all points that his lines were completely broken and his troops thrown into confusion which upon the second day resulted in a panic the most heroic defence the enemy could make did not enable him to stay the impetuosity of thomas's troops battery after battery fell into the hands of our forces and prisoners were captured by the thousand all the enemy's dead and wounded were abandoned on the field and the line of his retreat was covered with abandoned wagons gun carriages knapsacks blankets and small arms in two days thomas had captured over four thousand prisoners and fifty-three pieces of artillery and left hood's army a wreck the pursuit of the enemy was continued for several days and much additional damage inflicted on the eighteenth general grant telegraphed to thomas the armies operating against richmond have fired two hundred guns in honor of your great victory one hundred guns had been the salute fired in honor of other victories hood's army was pursued and driven south of the tennessee river in this campaign he had suffered ignominious defeat with the loss of half his army thomas's captures amounted to more than thirteen thousand prisoners and seventy-two pieces of artillery two thousand deserters had also given themselves up to the union forces and taken the oath of allegiance to the united states government the remnant of hood's demoralized and disorganized troops were no longer held together in one army some of them were furloughed and allowed to return to their homes and the rest were transferred to the east and joined the forces there for the purpose of opposing sherman thomas's entire loss in this campaign was about ten thousand men in killed wounded and missing general grant's predictions that hood would turn north and not follow sherman when the latter cut loose from atlanta and that thomas's army would crush hood's as soon as it was led against it were completely fulfilled there has been so much discussion in regard to the actions of general grant and general thomas during the two weeks preceding the battle of nashville that a synopsis of the correspondence between them has been given in order that the reader may form his own conclusions general grant has been charged with being inimical to thomas allowing himself to become unduly irritated over the delay of the latter and ordering an ill-advised advance of the army against thomas's expressed judgment the general-in-chief had had a larger experience with confederate armies than any one else and felt that the urgent orders he gave were necessary and as he was held responsible by the government and by the country for the operations of all the armies and the success of the cooperative movements which he had planned he certainly exercised a perfectly proper authority in giving the orders he issued when general thomas did not obey the instructions repeatedly sent him the general-in-chief did not treat the case as one of insubordination or defiance and act hastily or arbitrarily in taking steps immediately to enforce his orders but exercised a patience which he would not have done under other circumstances or toward any other army commander he felt while sending his urgent dispatches for an advance of the army that he was doing thomas a positive service for he knew better than any one else could know that as soon as thomas launched his army against hood's forces he would win triumphantly and demonstrate to the country what was already known to his fellow-officers that the rock of chickamauga was worthy of being placed in the front rank of the great commanders of the war it was because he felt entire confidence in thomas's ability to whip hood that he urged thomas to strike and not because he doubted him when general grant made his report of the operations he stated in referring to general thomas substantially what he had said in conversation at headquarters after the victory of nashville his final defeat of hood was so complete that it would be accepted as a vindication of that distinguished officer's judgment on the other hand there were those who criticized general thomas severely for disobedience of orders of his superior officer and manifesting a spirit of insubordination at a critical crisis of the war 
such insinuations when all the circumstances are taken into consideration would attribute to general thomas traits of character which were certainly foreign to his nature he believed that he was right and that he was acting for the best interests of the service and evidently felt so thoroughly convinced of this that he was willing to run the risk of assuming all responsibility and to submit to being displaced from his command rather than yield his judgment there is very little doubt that if any other two general officers in the service had been placed in the same trying circumstances there would have been an open rupture but both being men of patience as well as firmness their correspondence was conducted without acrimony the services of both were utilized for the benefit of the country and each was prompt to acknowledge the high qualifications of the other their personal relations were not broken as has been alleged by this circumstance as far as any observer could judge general thomas when he came to washington after the close of the war dined with general grant at his house and at the table with him at the houses of common friends where i was present and their intercourse never seemed to be marked by any lack of cordiality on either side End of chapter twenty two